Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Michael Talercio. I'm the pastoral intern of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church, and we are on day 333 of our daily walk through the scriptures with Jesus, one chapter per day. I'm excited for this chapter. We have Judges 3 on day 333, so I don't know what to tell you about that, but the Trinity, one God, three persons, uh, maybe this is some sort of sign. No, I'm just kidding, but I'm excited to get into the passage with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us Judges chapter 3. Uh, we need it, Lord. We need to see what you're telling us in it, Lord. There's a glorious message at the heart of this chapter. Would you help us to see it in the short time that we have together? And would you just bless uh, us as we believe it? Would you enable us to believe it? And would you bless our belief in it as a result of your gift to enable us to believe it? May Jesus get the glory since the passage is ultimately pointing us to him. In his name we pray. Amen. Judges chapter 3. Now, these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations the five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from, Baal, from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Lebohamath. They were for the testing of Israel, to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cush and Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cush and Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishatham. So the land had rest forty years. Then Othniel the son of Kenaz died. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute to him, tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab, and Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes, and he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, and when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded, Silence! And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. Then Ehud went into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, Surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited until they were embarrassed. But when, the, but when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. 
Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about ten thousand of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for eighty years. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed six hundred of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. I love this chapter of Scripture. There's... <laughs> There are three great accounts of God saving his people through these different judges. And yes, I do include that last section, just one verse, verse 31, including Shamgar in that, uh, in that tally of three. I think, I think there's much to be said of even that one verse. And I will probably not get to it because I want to kind of take the passage in order and I'm going to try to honor our time this morning. So if you see me in person and want to chat with me about my... Uh, enjoyment of Judges 3.31 um, and, and what I think the significance of it is, and please do so. Please um, just let me know. I'd love to talk about that. But there's a lot in the text. Uh, the chapter begins with somewhat of a summary of what we've seen so far in Judges chapters 1 and 2 and also in the book of Joshua. We see the Lord uh, making it clear that there are problems amongst his people. And in fact, what we get from today's chapter, today's opening verses, is that the Lord is allowing the people that Israel was supposed to drive out in the time of Joshua and at the beginning of the book of Judges, he's allowing those people groups to reside in the land. He's, a, he's leaving them there for a purpose. And in this chapter, chapter 2, 3 verse 2, it says that the Lord has left these people groups who worship false gods and who are a snare to his people. He's leaving them there in part so that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. And what's interesting is I just mentioned it's he's leaving them there in part, but it says in verse 2, it was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war. And then in verse 3, these are the nations, he describes them. And then it says in verse 4, they were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the purpose is twofold, right? It, it's only that they might know war, but it's also to test the people of Israel. And the reason I'm, I'm highlighting this is because it's really one purpose with multiple facets, right? The Lord left these people there as a snare. We read about it in chapter two of Judges because they had disobeyed him. So it's, it's a punishment, but it's also for the purpose of teaching them war and for testing their hearts. So there's all these different aspects, but it's really one purpose. It's because God has a people and he will see to it that his people grows to trust him and is saved by him. That's exactly what we see in today's passage. We see God delivering his people from oppression, from those who are oppressing them, despite the fact that the reason they're being oppressed is because of their rebellion against God. So God is teaching his people that it's not okay to turn away from him to other gods. He will allow troubles and trials in their lives. That is part of his grace. That's part of what he's doing in our lives now, just as a side comment before we even look at these judges. What God is doing is teaching us to war against our rebellion. He's teaching us to war against our sin. And he does that through these various judges. He at least points us forward to how that can happen in our lives through these judges. First of whom is Othniel. He's the first judge in the book, and his name means Lion of God. He is the son of Caleb's brother, Caleb himself being from the tribe of Judah. So we have the Lion of, the, of God from the tribe of Judah. I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, calling him the Lion of Judah. 
because he's prefiguring somebody also known, known by that title. Um, but he is the Lion of God from the tribe of Judah. And he goes up against the king of Babylon, called in this passage Mesopotamia. The king of Mesopotamia, the king of Babylon, his name is Cushan Rishathaim, which means cushion of double wickedness. And it is upon this Othniel whom the spirit of the Lord rests. It is upon him that the spirit of the Lord rests. So, the lion of God from the tribe of Judah, upon whom the spirit of the Lord rests, goes up against the king of double wickedness who rules over Babylon. Does that sound like anybody that you've heard of? <laughs> Jesus, the Lion of Judah, goes up against the, the ruler, uh, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, as Paul describes him in Ephesians chapter 2, Satan, who is ruling over Babylon, which is really just description for the world in opposition to God, the true king. Babylon. The lion of the tribe of Judah goes up against the king of double wickedness who rules over Babylon and defeats him, not by might, but by his blood. He defeats the rule of Cushan Rishathaim, the rule of Satan over all of his people. Praise God for Jesus. Wow, may we follow in that warrior's footsteps. Now, let's just briefly note a couple of features about this warrior. This warrior uses a sword to defeat his enemies. And we see that in the next judge's account there, Ehud. We see Ehud pulling a sword from his right thigh using his left hand, because he's a left-handed man, to defeat Eglon, the king there. And isn't Jesus this same true judge that we see foreshadowed in Othniel? Isn't Jesus the one who has a double-edged sword coming from his mouth? Doesn't he use that double-edged sword, uh, the sword of the spirit, the sword of truth, to defeat the lies in the world, to defeat the powers of darkness? Doesn't he do that? He does indeed. And I find it interesting, just a, just a little detail here in the account with, uh, with Ehud, uh, just... Just a detail that I love that I wanted to share. In verse 19, we see Ehud going to defeat Eglon. And in the process, he, he turns back at the point where the idols are near Gilgal. He goes, he kills Eglon at the height, the pinnacle of the passage. And then he goes back and escapes in verse 26 past the idols again. He escapes to Sarah. So he stops at the point where there are these idols uh, and then he goes and kills the king who worships these idols. And then he passes by them again on his way out of the territory. It's as if God, through the author, author of the book of Judges, is mocking these false gods in the land and saying that the, the true deliverer of his people just passes by these idols as if they're stubble. Because that's what they are. The true deliverer saves God's people and regards the fake gods of the land as though they're just rubble on the ground. Um, lastly, uh, in brief, it looks like we're going to get to Shamgar after all. Just, just a brief comment. Here's a man who is very likely a farmer. He uses an ox goad to kill 600 Philistines. And an ox goad is really just a pointy stick that you would use if you were a farmer to prod your oxen on so that they can continue plowing the field ahead of them. So here's Shamgar using this pointy stick to kill 600 Philistines. Now, it's possible that this was a, an amazing feat that happened all at once, kind of like we read about later in the book of Judges with, uh, with Samson and how he was able to defeat all of these Philistines with the, the jawbone of a donkey. But, but my read of this text is that that's not exactly what's happening. I, I kind of picture here a farmer who's just picking off Philistines, the enemies of God's people, one at a time over the course of many years. I, I heard this interpretation from somebody once, and I, I think there's something to it. Here's a guy who's just faithfully doing the Lord's will, fighting against the enemies of God's people, little by little, as he has opportunity over the years. 
and saving Israel, as it says at the end of the verse. He's saving Israel in this respect. He's a faithful man of God, doing the work that God has called him to do over many years. And isn't that what Jesus does? Isn't Jesus completely faithful? Wasn't Jesus faithful to the Father's will for his life, not only on the cross, but even in being conceived in the womb of Mary, in being born in a humble estate, raised as a, a, a child who is probably thought to be illegitimate by many in the community because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb? Didn't he suffer much in his faithful growing and being misunderstood by those around him? Didn't he serve God, his Father, by being amongst God's people and working hard as a carpenter, keeping his mouth and his heart free of complaints as he probably stubbed his, his thumb many times and, and worked arduously to glorify God and serve his fellow brothers and sisters in, in the community. Wasn't Jesus always faithful to do that work? And then in his ministry, wasn't he always, a, wasn't he always fighting against the oppressiveness of sin and false ideas about God? He was faithful faithful in every respect to do the work of his father, to eventually set men free by dying for them on the cross and rising again to new life. God honored that faithfulness in his son. And Shamgar is just a tiny glimpse forward of what such faithfulness would look like. So we see three pictures of Jesus the true judge in today's passage. We see in Othniel, the lion of the tribe of Judah, defeating Satan and his hold on God's people in the land of Babylon. We see the sword that Jesus used being thrust into the stomach of Eglon. We see the sword of Jesus going forth into the world and defeating, laying bare the lies of humanity and sin. And we see faithfulness bit by bit uh, fighting against God's enemies. Now, again, just to, just to wrap up and bring this home to us, the enemies we fight against are not other human beings. We, we might fight their ideas uh, that people might have that set themselves up in opposition to God. And we're called to do that as Christians, but we're, we're called to war against our own sin. We're called to war against our flesh. We're called to war against the devil's tyranny in the world. And Jesus is the perfect judge who enables us to do that. Let's go to him in prayer and ask him to help us as individual uh, judges under his true judgeship, under his true lead, his true conquering power. Let's ask him to help us as miniature judges in a way to conquer the sin in our lives uh, through his spirit's power. Father, thank you that you've given us a picture of Jesus in each of these three judges. We thank you. We pray that today we would fight against our own sin, that we would fight the sin of unbelief in our lives, where we are tempted to believe that you won't deliver us, or that you don't have good in store for us. Would you keep our mouths from grumbling, keep our hearts from worshiping false gods, and keep us stayed on our true God and Lord, the true judge, Jesus. May we look to him and defeat sin in our lives through his power, through his spirit resting upon Upon us because of his lordship, his death and resurrection, and his reign evermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you for taking time to think about God's word with me and worship him in your heart today. God bless you. Mm -hmm.